Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of The Big Shift. I've got an unbelievable guest. Next today is uh, he knew John, got it well. He's got an unbelievable testimony, and he also got acquitted of three murders, guys. I mean, I've got it from people who knew him back in the day. He was one of the most feared guys in, in Ozone Park, Brooklyn, back in the day. Hi guys, how are you doing? I've just got to say thanks. Thanks everyone who's going into the uh, subscription model, stephengillen.com, all you guys out there who's getting the book. I've got another uh, wonderful book that's coming out. Of course, my story is being made into a film. One last thing, I have to do this. On The Big Shift, we're all about empowering people and really healing the world, guys. Just a shout out to uh scott and marla out there in arizona and our other friends in canada uh who are doing wonderful things with this guys it's an intention stick which we want to give to certainly everyone around the world but certainly every child around the world so they can live a life of positive intention i want to put something else below in the in the uh links and that about the intention sticks guys loads of children uh Children around the world, thankfully, we've been privileged to get them one of these. If you want to know more about this, please go underneath. There's going to be some links, guys. Thank you. My next guest is Robert Borelli. Hi, Robert. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. And it's an honor and privilege to be on your show. It's wonderful to meet you, Robert. And as I said, you know, you're one of the guys I've spoken to. A few guys who I talked to over there, people who knew you in the younger days, John A. Ly, a lot of other guys, you know, they've told me uh, about your unbelievable journey. And then you was, back in the day where they knew, one of the most feared guys. Now, I know you've um, been acquitted of three murders, and I know you've gone on to do really wonderful things, and we're going to get to that. But I want to go back a little bit to the old days for the people out there so they know a little bit more. Um he was closely associated with uh, Ronnie, Ronnie One-Arm Truccio, right? You know, yeah. very, very aligned to the Gambino family. Would yeah. you like to tell us a little bit about how this started for you? Well, for me and Ronnie, uh, particularly uh, since we're kids, Ronnie was a couple of years older than me and a lot taller than me. So me and Ronnie go back from all the way to Eastern Parkway uh, back in... I would say, let's say I had to be about maybe 14 years old. So we're talking about 40, 52 years ago. <laughs> so it's a long time. Anyway, I just gave up my age too. <laughs> but anyway, so me and Ronnie went back a long time, uh, uh, hung out together. He, he was, uh, like I said, older than me. He had my back when I was a young kid. And I was a feisty little kid, you know. I was a fighter type guy, you know. The neighborhoods at that point in time were separated, like blacks, Hispanics, you know, white people, Italians. And there was always clashes around, you know, going into from one neighborhood to another neighborhood. And at an early age, I built the reputation to be a little tough kid. So people like that. And Ronnie was already involved with some of these wise guys that I didn't even know yet because I was just a kid hanging out in the street being, a, you know, a fighter type kid. And uh, then me and Ronnie got close later on in the years, and uh, and from there we, we we went up there. But but Anthony Ruggiano, I don't know if you did anything with Anthony Ruggiano back I in know the Anthony. Team, team yeah, yeah, the yeah, I know Anthony. I know Anthony. You know, we're going to be speaking uh, again very soon. I've already done a little a little interview with um, Anthony. I know you was very 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 close to Anthony too. Yeah, and his father, Fat Andy. Yes. Yes. Okay, but so that's how it worked with me and Ronnie. Ronnie already was affiliated with them. I was just a, a kid. And then I would go to the clubs as a kid and uh, work, you know, they would have card games. And, and, you know, the thing is amazing is these guys are really very super intelligent because what they wanted to do is make sure everybody who was gambling didn't leave the table. And the reason why is they wanted the game to keep going. They didn't want to stop the progression of the game. So they would have a guy like me come around and give sandwiches. Now you've seen that on maybe The Sopranos. You might have seen that on on a, a couple other. Sh uh, 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 I'm trying to think. Uh, 
uh, um, Goodfellas. So that's kind of what I did. And I was about probably about 14, 15 years old doing that there. And then there's another guy, and I don't know how much we want to talk about his, his name, but uh, was Blaze Carrazzo. And he used to have me run around picking up policy slips. And, and uh, so that's, that's kind of how I was introduced a little bit as a young kid. But I really didn't know a lot about that lifestyle until I became like 17, 18 years old. Now, I know, for instance, um, Ronnie, Ronnie went on to be a capo. Later, he went on to be a capo in the Gambino family, yes. right? Now, look, I've done my research on you, Robert, as well as I've said. And they said, look, you know, if there was a kind of a toss-up between who was the tough guy between you and Ronnie, it was Robert hands down. This is what I'm being told, right? And I must say, you know, you was acquitted of two murders by the age of 20. Is that correct? That's, well, one I was acquitted, the other one got thrown out. Of, uh, thrown out. They couldn't, uh, they needed two witnesses. They only had one against me. So they had, a, after a lot of years battling in court, they dismissed that case. But I did beat one case on trial with five witnesses against me. So that was kind of, uh, I would say that that would be my claim to fame in the Gambino crime family because I was a guy that went to trial, stood up, didn't give no information, didn't give up anybody, went on trial for a serious case at the age of 20 years old. Well, I was probably about 22, 23 when we finally went to trial. So that kind of, everybody said, well, here's this young kid, man, he's on trial for murder with five eyewitnesses. He doesn't take a plea in the case, which most people would do with five eyewitnesses against them. And he fought it. He beat the case. And, and that was probably part of my reputation in the Gambino crime family. I, I call it my claim to fame in the Gambino crime family. This is Henry Hill stuff, right? Now, I know, you've got, I know you've got a real, real connection to Goodfellas. We're going to talk about that after, right? But um, so he was a rising star, really, in the mob at that age, at 20, right? Was this how it was? For you? Well, basically, you can go back to the age of 18 years old. Somebody got killed in a bar fight, and I was wanted for the murder, and Anthony Ruggiano's dad hit me out for a year and a half, you know, because I was close friends with Anthony, and uh, there was another fellow, his name was Joey, and that was Andy's godson, so he hit both of us out uh, all around New York, New Jersey, and a couple other places, so... Uh, that was like where, I guess you say, my reputation as a tough guy came because somebody got killed and, you know, that, in them days, back in this, that was back in 70, 1973, in them days you didn't hear that kind of stuff. So I guess everybody was impressed by it. And I don't know. Well, we know what it's like on the street. You know, it's 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 very tough. It's very tough. You know, their neighbors are very tough, and um, so um, we're going to go. With, you know, you've had a really interesting life. You know, and you've turned the corner. But before we go there, I want to go a little bit more to start. So, what really drove you in the early days, Robert? To you know, you was acquitted of murder. You was a tough guy. I know you was in the middle of a lot of heavy guys there. What drove you at this point? Did you want to be that? Did you have a five root butcher? Was you um, was you groomed into it? Well, I, I believe I was groomed into it. You know, I use and you know my my other part of my life is the transformation life. So I use that kind of discipleship that people how I disciple people today is how I was discipled back then. So there was this one guy, Nicky Carrazzo, who took a liking to me. He was one of the guys that had me hang out in his neighborhood when I was still in trouble for the murder cases. And this was, I'm only 19 years old at the time. And he took a big interest in me. And he, I, I don't like to use the word disciple in this form, but basically that's what it is. He mentored me and groomed me. Matter of fact, he did so well of a job with me, spending time with me, walking around corners, explaining the lifestyle to me and all that there, that there was times when I would go and meet with some people and I would talk to them and they would go back and tell Nikki, it was like I was talking to you. That's the kind of impact that he had in my life. Uh, he, I, I, I love Nikki and I still love Nikki and, and Lenny. Both of them took care of me really well in them days. Uh, 
And then things started changing later on, and I don't know, we'll get probably get into that later on. Now I've talked to John John A. Light, you know, and he's told me a lot. You know, uh, Ronnie Ronnie One Arm uh, uh, Terrazzo was involved in this case. You know, he said he said some stuff about John. So John told me that after that. You was kind of partners with John. What happened there with that, um, Robert? I'm not understanding. I'm sorry. I didn't understand that. Um, John A. Light. John? Okay. Yeah, John A. Light. John A. Light in the old days. Was you ever? Did you ever have any work with John, or what, was you was you a partner with John in the old days? N not so much a partner with John A. Light. But I was in prison in '82 to '84. When I came out in '84. Before I went to prison, I was the guy in the neighborhood. Everybody, and like you said, they did fear me. I'm not proud of that today, but they, at that point in time, yes, my ego was big. My reputation was big. I demanded respect. Didn't command it as much but as, as I demanded it, and that was my life. So Johnny, I think, was closer to my younger brother, Richard, at that time, because they're about the same age. I'm a little older than them, and... Johnny must have heard a lot about me according to what he told me. So when I went away and I came back, now he had the reputation. He kind of took my place when I was in prison. So when I came out, I heard about Johnny Ailey and I was wondering who this guy is and all that. So we did get close, but I didn't do a lot of things with Johnny uh, uh, and this for a, a, a couple of reasons. So. Yeah, that's what John uh, John told me. He, you know, he said to you, as you as the guy in the neighbourhood before him, Robert. You know, I'm just joining some dots here, right? So, um, what was, you know, now, you know, I know in these days you was involved in a lot of stuff from hijacking, uh, gambling, all the usual, all the usual racketeering crimes. So. Was it just the Gambino family that you was associated with? Yes, I associated with just the Gambino crime family, but I met a lot of other family guys. When I went to Manhattan, uh, Nikki would bring me with them and they opened up a dice game. And then there was a lot of other families around and there's quite a few of them. And, and I guess I had a charismatic personality because people gravitated to me. I, I was just a well-liked guy, but also in the same sense, with some of these bosses well respected for, you know, the things that they heard about me. And you knew John got his senior well. Excuse me, I'm sorry. You knew John Gotti uh, senior well? Did you know John? They grew up in my neighborhood. So I was close. I knew his brother Jeannie well. Johnny was a little older than me. Jeannie and my sister used to hang out together on Fulton and Rockaway. I was closer at a, as a kid, a young kid, with his brother Vinny Gotti. But when John climbed up the ladder, everybody knew who Johnny was. And, you know, he heard some stuff about me. Matter of fact, there's a time that he actually sent for me because he heard something that I was going to shoot up the neighborhood where, he, where, he, where his club was and wanted to talk to me about it. But because I wasn't a made person, I couldn't really talk with him. So I said, well, if he wants to see me, he has to go through Nikki because Nikki was a main guy at the time. And nothing really came out. Nikki, Nikki, if it wasn't for Nikki, I wouldn't be alive today. Let me just say that. Nikki built me out of so many stuff. Yeah. That's interesting. It is. Yeah. No, no, I, I, can, I can get that, Robert, really. Um, so, look, tell, tell us about some of the other Gambino guys, names, names of the day who you knew or you come across or... Uh, inadvertently had some work with people like Sammy the Ball, any of these guys who, who people would know? Well, I mean, I was affiliated with uh, a, a lot of people, not just with the Gambino crime family, but with other families, you know. I mean, there was always interaction going on between us, you know. It's not like they were out, out of New York. They were part of the neighborhood. So we, we, we did things together. So, I mean, I... You want to look Jimmy Burke, you know, you could use Jimmy Burke. I wasn't really friendly as close to Jimmy Burke as I was to his son, Frankie Burke. And then also his daughter, Kathy Burke, because they were around my age group and, and, you know, just growing up in the neighborhood and me being having the reputation I want, I gravitated a lot of people towards me. So that's some of the names. I mean, uh, 
Fat Andy would probably be the greatest example because I'm only 17 years old hanging out with his son. And I speak about this a lot, even when I give my testimony in other places. And I say, the respect, he used to have a spread, which meant a, a meal for a lot of people every Friday night. And because I was with his son, his son would go there and bring me and this other guy, Joey, with him. And it was very impressive how this guy was, Andy was getting so much respect from all these people and they were big money people you know big earners powerful people and i was very impressed with that in an early age at 17 years old now here i am 17 years old sitting down with all these wise guys really i I have to tell you i became a legend so to speak in my own mind now i'm affiliated with something bigger larger than what most people are as a kid and that's kind of how it escalated in my life so we could talk about Fat Andy, because I, I knew about him, Tony Lee, Anthony Ruggiano, or Johnny A. Light, Ronnie One Arm, I mean, uh, Frankie Burke, you know, we could go on. Yeah, you. let's, let's, what was Frankie Burke like, right? Actually, like, did you meet him? You know, you knew oh, his yeah. son, no doubt you met him many times. What was he like, Robert? Me and Frankie used to hang out together after his father went to prison. Not too much before his father went to prison. When I first met Frankie, I want to be careful how much I say because I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble, that's for sure. But when I first met Frankie, he was with his father. It was probably maybe a month, two months after the Lufthansa heist. And I was working the crap game, the dice game, at at nighttime by Mulberry Street. And him and his father came in. That's the first time I met him because I knew who his father was, but I never met the son. So that's the first time I met him. And then later on in life, through doing, you know, we got involved with cocaine, and that's how me and Frankie became close friends. And I'm going to tell you a story that most people don't even know. Frankie was the type of guy that would insult people, and there was this one guy that was old-fashioned Italian from the other side, and uh, you couldn't insult him. It was a great disrespect. And I remember the guy coming to me, this guy, I'm not going to mention his name. And he said, I'm not going to handle this. I'm going to go do something. And I, I told him, don't do nothing stupid, man. Don't do nothing. So I'm not going to allow you to do something with me around. That's for sure. Especially at the place that we were in. It's kind of like an after hour joint that I, I ran. And then he respected that. But I told Frankie, be careful how you talk to this guy. And only about four months after that there, I was in Vegas. This guy ended up killing Frankie. Mm. You know, I mean, this is uh, an example of that life. It really is, uh, Robert. You know, I've, you may know a little bit about my story as well. So, you know, I get it. You know, and it can be anyone at any time, just these little things, you know. But that's an example of, of, what we choose, what we choose and how we live, yeah? Day to day in that life, you know? That's my understanding of it. Now, um, of course, Frankie Burke was in uh, uh, Immortalized in Goodfellas. You know, everyone would know who he was. And even the guys out there who may not know that name, they'll know the film and they'll know the portrayal, yeah? Um, So, as you went on in later life, because you was you was acquitted of another murder. There was three murders, um, Robert. Yeah, am I correct? There was actually four. Two that I was want. Two that I was un, under investigation about, but never got arrested for. And then back in in, in the early nineteen seventy five, I was arrested for the two murders earlier. And one of them I beat on trial, but the other one, like I said, got dismissed. And the other two murders that they wanted me, that they tried to put on me, it never stuck. So I never got arrested or indicted for that. Yeah, I know you can't talk too much about this. And, you know, this is in, you know, this is this is in past years. Uh, and you are where you are now. Look, I want to ask you some other questions because it's going to help clear up some things as well because you were there in these days as well. So what was your experience of John... John Aylard, what was your experience back in the day of John and what he was involved in and what he was like on the street, Robert? Okay, well, 
I'm a little bit old fashioned than Johnny A. Light because I, I, I'm about eight years older than him. So the, when I started getting involved with these guys, it was a whole different, whole different atmosphere, a whole different ballpark, to be honest with you. And when it came to drugs, that was one thing that I didn't get involved with at that point in time. I ended up getting caught up in it later on. So when I heard about Johnny A. Light and then I heard a couple of other names affiliated with Johnny A. Light, I never heard the name before, so I was shocked to hear this name, and I was wondering who it was. And I, you know, I didn't say, "Hey, I want to meet this guy" or anything like that. But I ended up getting to meet him while hanging out in bars, and I didn't know a lot about Johnny A. Light at that time. He knew more of me than I knew about him because of, like I said, maybe through my kid brother and the reputation that I had in the neighborhood. Because my reputation was pretty big; it was pretty big in the neighborhood. And I think the thing that made me so feared is I didn't value my life therefore I had no value for anybody else's life if that makes sense to you so if you messed with me consequences could be great and I didn't think about the consequences of what might happen to me afterwards no matter who you are it didn't make a difference I was not going to let nobody disrespect me and that was just the life that I lived no, I get that. I really do. You know, and I know how this life, you know, it sucks you in and, you know, you, you, you're, you, you know, you're really um, afflicted with a lot of, a lot of darkness comes, you know, with this stuff. This is, this is my experience, you know, especially with the guns and all the rest of it. Now, I know you had a drug problem as well. You went on, there was a drug problem. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, about the transition of that, Robert, and how that come about? What happened there? Well, yeah. You see, remember I told you I'm old school, so we didn't believe that we should get involved with drugs. Well, when I started hanging out in Manhattan in like 76, uh, 77, 78, working the crap games, these guys all were snorting cocaine. So now when you go to Mulberry Street, that's like another step above from, from where you're at. Because these guys, uh, Mulberry Street was like the the head honcho, so to speak. You had O'Neill Delo Gross, all of them hanging out there. So I worked, worked the games, and when I seen that happen, I got involved socially of doing it. And it took a while before I got brought down to my knees with it. And basically, I have an addictive personality. So it wasn't just drugs. I had a gambling problem. You know, you, I, I could go down the line of a lot of drinking, you name it. Whatever I did, I did it in, in excess, whatever it was. And even in that lifestyle that I lived, I did it in excess. Yeah, I made everybody know that if you mess with me, there's a good chance you're not going to be around to mess with anybody else. That's just how it was for me. Uh, so the drugs came gradually, and then little by little by little, you know, I say it this way. I said, I got involved with drugs. I started selling drugs. And then before you know it, the drugs were selling me. Yeah. And that's just to basically to, to sum up. I, I got involved with snorting coke. I got I, involved with selling coke. I got involved with the coke selling me. And then when everything, I lost everything. My reputation was still there, but... But the mob couldn't associate with me so much because I ended up getting involved with crack cocaine at that point in time. And that was probably about maybe 10 years later. So that consumed me. And I say today that that's what brought me to my knees. Yeah, it's so it's such a it's such a, uh, you know, a classical uh, story, Robert. You know, I've certainly been through it. I'm 12 years clean now. So. You know, I've been there, right? You know, I understand. I understand how this works. Look, um, so you know, you ended up in Rikers Island, didn't you? Yes. So, what was the before we go into that? I want to ask you, you know, because I know what your reputation was like back in the day, Robert. A lot of guys have told me, independent guys, right? But look, I want to ask you because I'm looking at where you are now, right? You know, and um, all credit to you, really. We're going to get there. But well, where did this killer instinct, this cold blood, bloody killer, this violent darkness come from in the old days? Where did it come from? Do you know, Robert? Well, first of all, I was small. We had gangs in the neighborhood growing up. 
People would try to pick on me. I wouldn't allow that to happen. So from an early age, man, I was the type of guy that would do whatever I needed to do to win a fight. Let's put it that way. There was a, a pride involved with me, even at an early age. But I think there was a lot of anger in me at those ages, too. Now, I can reflect back and, and see it differently. But at that point in time, I, I, I didn't know about it. I remember when my grandfather passed away, it kind of like, I don't know what happened, but this kind of changed a lot of my personality after my, because I, I loved my grandpa when he passed away, the way he passed away, falling downstairs. And then, you know, in them days, they didn't have young kids go and visit the funeral. So he was there one day and then gone the next day. So that was hard for me to resolve. And I think that, triggered a lot of anger in me that he wasn't with us anymore and not understanding. You know what I mean? Because I think I was like maybe eight or nine years old at that time. And I could see how the transition started from there. It's very interesting. Yeah, it is. I, you know, I get the anger really. You know, I know you've got a book out there. People read my book, you know, they would see it's, it's, it's very common, this anger. That's why I asked. I just, you know, I just wanted your view on that. You know, and later on in life, you know, when you when you went forward, uh, you you was married to Cookie Cookie DeVito, weren't you? I never married Cookie. No. We oh, you didn't marry her. All right. No, I didn't Sorry. marry Cookie. After after Tommy D. Simone disappeared, because they never found Tommy's body. After he disappeared, I started liking his his girlfriend. Now we go back a lot a long ways, me and Cookie, but I wasn't wasn't interested at that time, but now I was. So I go to my guys and I say, I want to make sure, is Tommy gone or is he just on the lam? Is he just hiding? Because I didn't know the whole full story. So they said, don't worry about it. He's gone because I told them I was going to start dating Cookie, but I wanted to get, I didn't want to do it because in that lifestyle, you don't date somebody's wife. That's for sure. So you want to make sure. So I did that and I went with her for about, I think about eight years. And Cookie was Tommy D. Simone's wife. Yeah, you know, and that portrayal again is in, is in Goodfellas, isn't it? You know, yes. Tommy, oh, yeah. Tommy, Tommy D. Simone for people who don't know. Yes. So, what changed in the life? You know, because you have transformed your life, and people have told me, look, Steve, this guy is the real deal. For someone who had the reputation on the street back in the day, confirmed, who done all of that stuff, all of that life, but it really changed. You know, people are telling me they're impressed by that. You know, that really impressed me, Steve. This guy's changed. Robert's changed, right? What was the start of this change, do you think, Robert? This is how I'll tell you the story the way I tell my story with everybody else that asks, that I go out and speak about. I believe I got a visit by two angels. Now, they weren't angels with halos. They were warrant officers. I was wanted for a case in Florida, a, a federal case. I was wanting a case in the state of New York for selling drugs. I called on my angels because on January 23rd, they tapped me on the foot, they pointed guns at me, and they said, now we got you. The reason why I call them angels is because that's the last time I had a drink of a drug. So they brought me to Rikers Island, and of course, as a person who's been in and out of prison, there's two things when I'm in prison that are important to me. First is, to get a good attorney to get me out of the mess I got myself into. That's very important. And the next thing is, no, I'm not going to get any bill. How could I get so much money in my commissary so I can live as comfortable as I possibly can while I'm in prison? So I made a lot of phone calls because now you have to remember, I told you I was strung out on crack cocaine towards the ends of my years, so I didn't have any money when they locked me up. So now I'm calling up a lot of people trying to get people to help me out financially. And the thing is, I walked out of my daughter's life when she was seven weeks old to go get high. And I'll never forget that. That was the turning point in my life where the shame and the guilt really played a big part of me using drugs even more. I don't blame my daughter. I blame me. Don't misunderstand me. So now my daughter's mom is allowing me to call her on the phone and I'm talking to her. But before that, then, I'm calling up these people trying to get and one girl who was a good friend of mine said, why don't you go read the Bible? And I'm thinking it's a brush up because nobody was wanted to help me. It came to the point where they believed that I was better off in, in prison than out on the streets because of my drug use. 
but I'm calling up my daughter this one time and she's crying. And I said, Brianna, why are you crying? She said, because you won't come and see me. Now, there's no drinking, there's no drug in it that, that, that I'm involved in at that time in jail. And I said to say not there, but I didn't bother with it. Uh, so now I have to deal with the reality of she's three and a half years old. I walked out when she was seven weeks old. The reality that struck me was there were so many times I was in the neighborhood and I'd rather use drugs than even to make an attempt to go see my daughter. I don't believe her mother would have let me, but I didn't even make the attempt. So the guilt, the shame just came on me. And I was raised Roman Catholic, so I, I knew about God, but I didn't know God. And there's a big difference. So I was, broke my heart, crying. I didn't want the inmates to see me. I slammed the phone down on my daughter. I run to my cell. And I just cried out to, to, to God. I said, if you're real, you either have somebody kill me or change me. I just couldn't live with the pain anymore that I was dealing with. I don't want to live anymore. And obviously God did the latter because I'm still here talking to you. So I didn't get killed in prison. And I believe at that point in time, the sincerity of my cry to ask God to change me, I started getting to know Jesus Christ. Not know about him, but know him personally. And then I just started reading the Bible. So, <clears throat> for the people out there, you know, uh, uh, Rob would say, oh, well, you know, and you chose that life and, you know, you make your bed, you're laying it and all that. Both of us know, Robert, this is not, you know, the, the, it's a lot more common. Lives are so much more, and journeys, even towards God or anyone's life, are so much more complicated. They're simple, but they're so much more complicated. What would you say to the people? Because when you left that life, you went into the witness protection program. Uh, is that right? Yes. Just for the people out there, because, you know, we put the content out. And then it's up to them what inference they take from that, you know? So what what was the transition in there for you to change? Because you're this guy on the street. This is interesting to help other people, Rob, you know? Well, so this transition, what was the transition, the change, to make you change, to start going the other way? Well, first of all, I don't give myself any credit for the change. Jesus Christ gets all the credit. I accept the sacrifice that he made on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. And the analogy that I use is what the government did for me in the physical, gave me a new life, a new name, slate white clean. There's no record of Robert Angle. That's who I was at that time in my old life. There's no record of him anymore. He doesn't even exist. And the way that God, the, the way that the government changed my identity, Jesus Christ gave me a new identity. He wiped my slate clean when I accepted the sacrifice at the cross. I have a new life in Christ Jesus. It's no longer, Paul said it the great way. Paul in Galatians 2.20 says this here, my favorite verse of the Bible. I have a lot of favorite verses, but this is one of them. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So if Christ can make the sacrifice for the forgiveness of my sins and he could give himself for me, then who am I not to give myself to him? So I believe when that cry in Rikers Island, God came into my life through the power of his Holy Spirit and my life just started changing. Now, it didn't miraculously change. It wasn't like... A wand went over my head, and but, but gradually, God, the transformation of God. You know, it says, I am sanctified. I am being sanctified. I will be sanctified. So the transition of the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm big with the power of the Holy Spirit, because that he gets all the credit for the change in my life. So so you had a spiritual, a spiritual awakening. Now I'm very spiritual, Rob. I'm very spiritual, right? You know, and I, you know, but that any any life that I live before I went to prison a long time, that's many many years behind me now. So, you know, we're into creating things, we're into healing people, places, and things now, and the world in different ways, but the same way that you are, right? So, you know, you went on, you know, you went on, and um, now look, you know, as I said before, for anyone out there. You know, I have a lot of independent guys in the background saying, look, this guy was the real deal, Steve. You know, he was the guy then, 
you know, but by the other token, you know, this guy is strong, Steve, because he's changed his life. He's the real thing. He's been in Africa. He's done all kinds of things out there. He's been helping loads of different people. This guy is strong because this guy is the real thing. You know, and a lot of them guys, they respect you, Robert. It has to be said. You know, they find it unbelievable because they know that your change is, is a real one. So what happened after that? You know, I know you've been to Africa and things like that. Tell us about what happened after that. Well, I think I married somebody from New York, which when I was in the Women's Protection Program, you weren't supposed to do that. You couldn't marry anybody from your danger zone. That was considered my danger zone. So they threw me out of the witness protection program. And because of that, there, there in the beginning, there was a little fear. My, I had gotten in touch with somebody from my family. And they said, everybody knows where you are. So it came a little fear in me at that point in time. So I wanted to make sure I took care of my, not my new bride. And me and her got hooked up with somebody. We moved to Utah. But somebody, Pat Robinson, when, I had a friend that was close with Pat Robinson from the 700 Club. And he said, if you're, this guy's really serious as far as doing ministry, let him go to Christ for the Nations. So in Texas, we have a school called Christ for the Nations, a Bible Institute. And I signed up for that, and I started going there. And then from there, I went to a Bible college called Criswell, uh, Criswell College. So I got some, some meat uh, about the Bible and some, uh, I guess you could say, strength. From from what I from the schools I was going to, and I believe you see this is three things that I believe Jesus does in our life. He seeks us, he saves us, and then he sends us. A lot of us don't want to be sent for him. So what I did was I just became a minister, a licensed minister. Uh, I was an associate pastor, and that was my life was to pursue Jesus Christ throughout my whole life. Not that he was far from me, but I wanted to get to know him more and more and more. I wanted to get to know him better, you know. The same way, like if I had a friend or a family member, I want to get to know them better. But that was that was how my heart was just for Jesus. I wanted to live totally for Him because I wanted to show Him the gratitude I have for the change that He made in my life. Because even today, it's hard for me to believe that who I was and where I am today that only God can do that. It's just a miracle. That's what it is, and God's not short of miracles. <laughs> Absolutely not. He's not, Robert. And so, look, to go a bit deeper for this, to try and help some people out there and a bit more content, absolutely. That guy who was there, and that's, you know, I certainly know from my, from my journey, you know, and it's, it's out there, it's all over the place too, but I, I can only speak for myself, and I know that, you know, it's not this magic wand, as you said, there was a process here. Some longer than others or whatever, you know, it's a very personal thing. So when you, so how about the guy who done all the darkness and all the bad stuff in the day? Do you still get haunted by some of this stuff? What was, what was balancing out your, 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 your spirit and your emotions and your mental ability like on this road to get where you are now? Well, the thing is, I'm very in John three seven, it says you must be born again in order to the enter or see the kingdom of God, and the process of that is accepting the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, and then allowing Him through His Holy Spirit to live in you and through you, as I explained in Galatians two twenty. It's a perfect analogy of that. So that transformation started in my life. But do I get haunted by the past? Satan's not going to leave you alone, especially the closer you get to God, the more that he's going to try to determine to get you out of that as a witness for Christ. You see, that's why I call this book, this is called The Witness. I was a witness for the government, now I'm a witness for Christ. That's the analogy that I use. So this is what I say to anybody that feels like they're stuck in any lifestyle. It's never too late for a new beginning. Whether you're saved or unsaved, I prefer you get saved. That's why I go out and I minister. That's why I go out and share my testimony. That's why I go to Africa and help kids uh, 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 who are poverty-stricken and try to build them homes and places to go. But the most important thing for me is that they come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's the most important thing. So I use certain things to bring people to introduce Jesus to them. And what they do with it, see... This, this, 
bracelet. I used to explain to a guy that was I was mentoring. I'd say, we're like God's mailmen. Now you take a mail person from the post office, they, they get a bunch of mail and they have a route where to deliver the mail. After they deliver the mail, their job is over. They don't go back to see if the people picked up the mail, if they, whatever they did with the mail, they completed their job. That's what us, I feel I'm the mailman for Jesus Christ. I'm gonna share his mail, his message to everybody. And then what they do it is really up to them. Because I don't think about what the results are because I'm not in control of the results. My life is about ministering Jesus Christ to other people, to introduce them to other people. And that's what I do. That's what, that's what I live for today. And I'm the most happiest guy in the world <laughs> doing it. Thank, thanks, Robert. But on the big shift, you know, we've had a lot of... A lot of people from billionaires, you know, there's a, a lot of big name mob guys, there's the big actors, there's innovators, there's all kinds of people. But what it's really about as well is big shift stories, we call it, which is the real transformation to get the real jewels, right? Of, of uh, I really um, identify with people who have had adversity and tough roads. Just like you do, you know. There's a there's a there's a forging in there, you know. And through through um, listening to people like you, Robert, and your stories of adversity from darkness to light, you know, I push and pull a bit because it's it's real stuff, you know. And it's about someone out there or people out there that just maybe one little bit of content or something which helps to put them lights on and helps them to pivot out of their own challenges or their own adversity. So what do you think about the life that you led before? What do I think about the life in the mob? Yeah, the darkness. What do you think about the life you lived before? Okay, now I look at it as complete darkness, that's number one. I look at it, and I'm not trying to disrespect anybody, but this is how I look at it, is a real man is the one that can change his life not a real man that's going to stay stuck in the same situation that he's in. To me, a real man that say, I, I was brought up a real man. You went to jail. You did your time. That was a man. But what about your family? What kind of man really leaves his family to spend time in prison because of the accident without trying to change his life, without being there? See, kids today, they don't want to, you know, the, the, the analogy I would say is, is this here. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you're leaving your kids behind because you feel you have to be the man to go into prison or live that lifestyle that's going to put you in those situations, to me, that's not a man. That's just my opinion of it. I don't believe that anything that I did, matter of fact, I don't even like to share so much about my past because as far as I'm concerned, that guy, Robert Engel, is dead and Robert, Robert Borelli is alive. And that's how I look at it. So when Satan comes to try to tell me about my past, I always try to remember about, uh, remind him about his future. And Robert, look, you know, the reason why I say that as well is because, you're, of course, you're entitled to your opinion because you lived it. That's the difference here. There are many people who talk about stuff, and thankfully, you know, be careful of what you wish for. They haven't lived it. But there's real jewels in having lived a life like that and especially transforming. Like, you know, there are so many guys, Robert. I mean, I know so many friends of mine. They're never going to see the light of day again. They're sitting in prison. A lot are not here still. You know, they're never going to be here, right? They didn't get any chance. They didn't, you know, there ain't no chances when you, when you live a life like that, really. So to transform in that way is very rare. You know, and it's all about, it's all about healing the world and, you know, giving people tools to help them go forward because look you know it's about stepping into our full light stepping into our full light you know this is a lifetime's work you know that so so from what you lived in your life you know the darkness to the light what would be the main thing that you would say to anyone out there who may be in that kind of life a bit or thinking of getting into that life or wants to get out of that life what would you say to them Robert? Well, that's what I say. It's never too late for a new beginning, no matter where you're at, whether you're stuck in, whatever you feel you're stuck in. You see, sometimes we'll be in a situation we feel helpless. 
So my word to them is, you're not hopeless, though. As long as you have a breath in your body, God can use you. All you have to do is ask him to come and live in you. Accept the sacrifice that he made. Even if people who are in prison or are stuck and they might not ever get out, my thought is, where am I spending eternity? Well, the, the Bible says, what good is a man he gains the world but loses his soul? Nobody talks about eternity too much. It's not even preached about that much. But that's my heart. My heart is for my daughter, for my family. I want to spend eternity with them, which is forever and ever and ever. So I minister to as many people as I possibly can because my thought is what's waiting for me, not what, I, what I'm doing right now. You know, not where I'm stuck at right now. So anybody, whether you're in prison or not, maybe you're never going to get out there, but at least you can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You could read the word of God, accept the sacrifice he made, and then you have something to look forward to for eternity. But whether you believe it or not, whether you believe it or not, everybody's going to spend the eternity. It's just a matter of where you're going to spend it. It's either in heaven or in hell. So, Robert, <clears throat> show the book there. You got the book there. Put the book up so that you know, so the guys can see the book. You know, I know there's going to be some unbelievable uh, stuff in that book there. You know, there's the book there. You know, I know you've got your website and different stuff, you know, and you go out, you do public speaking, you know, you do some other stuff. So, you know, guys, if you want to, you know, there's always riches in these stories. You know, if you want to go in there, you want to know more about Robert's story, and it's quite a story, I'll tell you. You know, go in there, you've got your website there. I mean, your name now is Robert Borelli, you know, but your real name is Robert, Robert Engels, right? Yes, Engels, yeah. But people Engels. used to call me Angles because they thought that's how I fought. That's how I got the legend. Everybody thought I was Italian. So anyway, yeah. Well, so if you go to the website, it's for any donation, for any donation. And if you give me your information while you make the donation, I'll sign the book if you want it signed. If you don't want it signed, that's okay with me. I don't, you don't need my autograph. But if you do, I'll sign it for you, and then I can mail it to you. That's how it works with the website. Or you can go to Barnes & Noble or Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and you can purchase it there. But when you do it there, if you want the neurograph, I won't be able to do it. So, Yeah. Uh, Robert, you know, and I know, look, you know, I know you're, you have done and you're doing constantly a lot of work in Africa. I know you've, you know, you've been building homes over there and different things. You've been, you know, helping a lot of people, right? You know, this is, this is a wonderful thing, I have to say. I wish you well, you know, on all the work that you're doing in the future, you know, and all that. And uh, thanks for coming on, Robert. Well, it's an honor and privilege to have met you and see the face that are the people I was talking to. And, you know, um, I, I pray that you continue to do the work that you're doing because life is really about how God can transform a life, how he can change you and take you from darkness to light. The last message I'd like to leave, if you allow me to do it, is Absolutely. the Bible says we're ambassadors of Christ. You don't have to be in a church. I recommend that you do go to a church because it's, it's the church is not the building. The church is the people. Paul talks about the church met at somebody's house, not the church was in somebody's house. But the body of Christ now lives in us. We are the tabernacle of Christ. We're ambassadors of Christ. So wherever we go, we represent him. So I... For all those that are saved, make sure you're making a good impression of who lives in you, of the faith that you have, that you're an ambassador of Christ, and you're gonna, you, he's going to be able to live through you no matter what circumstance, situation comes in your life. Thanks, Robert. And look, you know, I just have to say, you know, I want people to be successful. You know, I want them to be happy. You know, I want them to, uh, you know, to be joyous. I want them to be safe. You know, I want them to be blessed. I want them to be blessed in all, you know, all that they do. I want their families to be, you know, to be blessed. You know, and I want them to step into their own light, whatever that may be. You know, so Robert, it's been, it's been great talking, uh, talking to you, brother. Thanks for coming on. Well, God bless you. I appreciate it. Thank you for allowing me to be on. Make sure to subscribe, like, go into stephengiller.com and sign up for more wonderful content to expedite, help and support you on your own personal journey.
journey of success.